Okay, so this will be shorter um, of me just standing up here talking. Just about 15 slides. And what I'm going to talk about is how we can find rearrangements using um, these read alignment methods that we that I, uh, we explored in the first part of the morning. Um, so there's a lot of different categories of variations. So there's single nucleotide variants, like just uh, single bases that have been changed in the reference. There are short indels, which we usually define as being indels that are less than the read length. Uh, so these are bit pieces of sequence that have been inserted into the reference or deleted from the reference. And then there are larger structural variations, uh, like large insertions and deletions, um, pieces of the reference that have been inverted, um, and then translocations where whole arms of chromosomes could be swapped, and also copy number variation where some sequence has been amplified uh, or deleted. So in this module, we're just going to deal with structural variation, in particular large insertions and deletions, inversions and translocations, and then in subsequent modules, like tomorrow, um, they'll cover single nucleotide variants and copy number variation. So there are, really, there are two different ways of doing paradense sequencing. So the method that I described in the morning um, was doing, uh, which, which we refer to as paradigm sequencing, where we, we take fragments of DNA, which are fairly short, from about 200 to 500 bases. We add sequencing adapters to um, each end of the DNA fragment, and then we sequence inwards from the ends. And we get this um, the sequence where one read is mapped to the forward strand, and one read is mapped to the reverse strand. We saw that uh, this morning. Now, this gives us quite... Um, short range information and there's a method called mate pairs which allows us to to do much larger uh, sequencing of pairs so in, in this way we take longer fragments of DNA which are multiple kilobases say 10 kilobases in length we make a circle from the DNA and then we shear the circle randomly pull down um, the piece that has the adapter in it and then sequence the ends of those fragments and that gives us much longer range information. So if we sequence um, the ends of this fragment here, where this, the, in, the, the adapter sequence, which we use for the pull down, is in orange, that corresponds to the very far ends of this circle of DNA that we started with. So now instead of having local information, which is 200 to 500 bases, um, we have much further distance uh, on our reference genome, and that makes it easier to map and easier to find very large structural variation. But this requires extra library prep, it requires extra sequencing, so the paired end version where we just sequence short fragments of length around uh, 200 to 500 is, is much more common. Um, so I'll be describing these, these rearrangement finding algorithms in terms of just normal Illumina paired ends, where we have one read which is pointing forward, one read which is pointing reverse. Um, so this just describes the expected orientation of our pairs. Um, well, as I just said, one read is on the forward strand, one read is on the reverse strand. There's some sequence in the middle that we, we didn't sequence, we don't know about. And there's an expected insert size. So some people asked about um, BWA's flags of what a proper pair is in the last uh, the last part of the module. So what BWA does is it, when it maps all of these pairs to the reference genome, it samples alignments to try to learn what the distribution of fragment sizes are. So um, usually this is a normal distribution, or at least it can be approximated with a normal distribution. So we'll try to figure out what the shape of this distribution is and what the mean insert size or fragment size is for the library. And it uses this information to determine whether the pairs um, are as expected when mapped to the reference genome. So if, if you imagine we've, we've calculated this distribution, which has a mean of 300 bases and a standard deviation of, say, 30 base pairs, then any read that's outside of, say, 300 plus or minus three standard deviations of this insert size is mapping abnormally. Um, and we call those discordant read pairs. And these discordant read pairs are the ones that give evidence of structural variation. So now what I'm going to do is just go through some different examples of structural variation that we can find and what this, the insert size and the read pair orientation tells us about this structural variation. 
Um, so the easiest one to find are deletions. So I'm going to be using diagrams like this, where we have the donor. This is the individual that we've sequenced. It might be um, the, uh, the cancer genome. And then we have the reference on the bottom. So here, the reference has this uh, large red block, which is deleted and not in the donor. So we, I've denoted the deletion as just having these dashed lines here. And now if we sequence the donor, we're going to sample read pairs that span across this junction, the breakpoint where this deletion is. And now if our paired end uh, library is around 300 bases, we'd expect that on average the, pair, the distance from this end of the pair to this end of the pair is about 300 bases. Now when we map pairs that have been sampled from the donor to the reference genome, because BWA has to account for the fact that there's this the sequence that was deleted, it puts the pairs much further apart on the reference. So if you look at that insert size field in, um, in the SAM file, this will be 300 plus the size of this deletion on average. So what we can do is we can scan along the genome looking for pairs that are mapped much further than apart than expected. And this gives us a signal of uh, a possible deletion. Now the opposite event is an insertion. So here, um, this red box represents the, some sequence that has been inserted into the donor that's not in the reference. And here, BWA is going to map the pairs much closer together because it's not, uh, it's not accounting for this insertion. So if the distance from here to here is 300 again, then the distance all mapped to the reference is going to be 300 minus whatever this inserted sequence is. Um, now, insertions are harder to find because if you can, if you can imagine um, a 10,000 base pair insertion, you're not going to have reads that span from one end of the insertion to the other. So it's generally easier to find deletions using these sort of methods than it is to find insertions. Um, so another type of structural variation would be a tandem duplication. So here there's um, a sequence in the donor that's copied to and it's been duplicated um, at the same location, so just the same sequence has been uh, copied once. So here if we have pairs that um, are sampled from the end of the first copy that span the breakpoint and go to the start of the second copy, when we map these pairs to the reference genome, this pair is going to align here, but because there's no co second copy in the reference, this pair has to be mapped back to the start of this duplicated sequence. And what happens is that now the orientation of the pairs are incorrect. Instead of the pairs pointing at each other, they point away from each other. So this is another signature of a, um, of a structure of variation that we can use to find these type of events. Likewise, if there's an inversion, we have a unique signature. Here in the donor, we have this blue segment it was flipped, so it's now uh, the opposite sequencing strand. And if we sample the pair from the start of the inversion, when BWA goes to align it, it has to put this sequence here on the opposite strand of the reference, and now the pairs point in the same direction. So that's another signature of an inversion. So this is just a summary of the different types of structural variation and with the orientation we expect. So for insertions and deletions, we expect the normal orientation of pairs, but the mapping distance is different. For inversions, we expect the pairs to point in the same direction, um, but the insert size will typically be quite different than expected. Uh, for tandem duplications, we expect the pairs to map uh, away from each other, and again, the insert size will probably be quite different than expected. For translocations, we expect um, for interchromosomal translocations, we expect one pair to be mapped to one chromosome and the other pair to be mapped to a different one. And the orientation can be really anything in these cases. So as I said before, insertions are, are a particularly tough case because we, we rarely will have pairs spanning across the insertion unless it's quite small, less than our fragment size. Um, so what can happen is that we can only, we might only find pairs that are on, um, that were sampled from the inserted sequence which isn't part of the reference and these won't align to the reference so the, the event can be not de uh, might not be detected in this way so here we'd probably want to use different methods like 
uh, a de novo assembler, which would try to assemble the inserted sequence, and then we could map like that. But these are more experimental methods that are still in development. Um, another signature uh, that doesn't use paired orientation is looking at split reads. So as I mentioned before, BWA will try to introduce small gaps when it aligns the reads. If these deletions are small enough, it might um, align one, ha one bit of the read to before the breakpoint and then the other part of the read after the breakpoint, and we end up with a read with a long gap in it. And uh, this might also indicate that there's a deletion here. Most structural variation callers will use both split read signatures and paired end orientation and uh, insert sizes to, to jointly look at for evidence of structural variation. So when we're looking for rearrangements in cancer, there's really two different approaches that we can take. Usually you've sequenced both the tumor and the individual's normal genome, and we're not as interested in um, all the structural variation that's the, in the inherited germline genome. We're more interested in the structural variation that's occur, uh, occurred in, in the tumor. So there are two approaches to doing this. First, we can do structural variation calling in the tumor sample and the normal sample independently, and then filter out all of the events that are in the tumor that are not in the normal. Or what we can do is f just find uh, structural variation in the somatic samples, and then remove any of them that have evidence, like uh, these discordant read pairs that are in the germline sample. And most programs that you'll download and run for structural variation calling in cancer will be following approach two, where it's jointly looking at both the tumor sample and the normal sample at the same time as a stronger way of filtering out germline events. Um, so now, I think the new for 2014 is that there's a gene fusion module. Um, so this is going to be covered in the afternoon. So I'm just going to skip this. But this is a type of rearrangement where um, there's a translocation that's, that's joined the exons of two different genes, and then you get this chimeric uh, protein that is possibly functionally relevant in cancer. And Andrew McPherson will talk about these type of events in much more detail this afternoon. Um, now, structural variation calling is quite difficult, and the methods used and the software used is under constant development. In the practical session, which we're going to start in just a few minutes, um, I chose a tool named Hydra from Aaron Quinlan's lab, primarily because it's very easy to run and it gives you a good overview of the, of the steps required to uh, pre-process the data for, to run structural variation caller. Now, this isn't an endorsement, it's the best structural variation caller, and the state of the art in the field is changing quite rapidly. So I wanted to take this chance just to plug a project that OICR is helping lead, which is a mutation calling challenge run through uh, these dream competitions. So Paul Boutros' lab has developed um, a set of simulated genomes where they've spiked in um, structure variation events like deletions, insertions, inversions, and they release this data to the community. Anybody who's interested in developing software to call structure variation, then people run their software on it, submit variant calls to Paul's group, and then they score each one to see how well the different software is performing. And there's a lot of variability within uh, structural variation calling methods. And you can go to this website, uh, which is, if you just Google ICGC TCGA Dream Mutation Calling Challenge, you can see a sort of leaderboard of which tools are performing best. And this changes quite rapidly. Um, so when you're looking to run structural variation callers on your own data, this is a great resource of, run, of figuring out what the state of the art is in the field. I also recommend that you don't just pick one tool and then trust its output. I suggest you run multiple different tools and cross-check against each other as a way of increasing um, both the, the power to find true events and removing ones that are possibly spurious uh, that you might not trust. And within the practical session, I'll be, you'll be looking at um, different structural variations within IGV as a way of understanding how these patterns of pairs look uh, when you look at their alignments. Okay, with that, we'll start the next exercise.